As we've been moving through the high Renaissance, we've been thinking about the change in the status of the artist, the idea that we begin to see some rare but important artists who stop being anonymous craftspeople like a medieval artist or a skilled entrepreneurial craftspeople and become a kind of a superstar, an innovator, a genius, someone who has a kind of brilliance that sets them apart and gives them a degree of independence. So one Venetian artist who stands out for making a significant mark on his time and on art history is Giorgio de Castelfranco, Castelfranco and his nickname is Giorgioni. He comes from a small town, Castelfranco, in the Veneto, the Venetian region. And he's hugely important, although only about six paintings are reliably attributed to his hand. So Giorgione himself is an enigma. His paintings are enigmatic, and yet his influence is really significant. Look at what kind of a genre or kind of painting we are looking at here. It's not a kind of painting that is any genre recognizable from what we've studied in the Renaissance or before. So it's not an altarpiece. There's no biblical historia and there's no classical mythological scene. Instead, it's a poesy and invention. This artist is inventing a fantasy world, making up an imagined reality. And using the techniques of illusionism to create this dream world. That is different than artists who came before Giorgione when they needed their, the subject matter was generally spelled out in the contract, what they were supposed to show, what historia or what classical mythology. It's very new for the artist to be putting together this nude woman nursing a child who's sitting in a landscape while there's a thunderstorm happening and a mysterious soldier figure is on the other side of the stream bank. So this fascinates us, but it eludes clear explanation. So now in terms of meaning, the artist's inventiveness is taking precedent over tradi traditional conventional ideas and subject matters. In terms of technique, Giorgione was also the first to exploit the luminous effects of the new Venetian techniques of using oil on canvas rather than panel paintings, solid oak panels. And so you see that luminosity. There's a glow even to the grass. There's a subtle glow in the water and in the sky. And if we could see this in person and not in reproduction, it would be even stronger, this sense of the colors themselves glowing. And this is partly because working with oil on canvas, he is using flexible resins. So you use resins to mix your oil and your, your ground up pigment when you're a painter. And the painters of the North, like Van Eyck, had used hard resins to create an enamel finish, like nail polish type finish. But this is allowing for a softer merging of color into color. We're starting to get an interest in free flowing brushwork that shows the artist's hand of blending the colors and creating the luminosity. So once again, the artist's inventiveness, the artist's creativity is coming to the foreground, not the sacred purpose, not the humanistic interest, but what the art artist can do for art. We are getting a glimmer of art for art's sake. And as an, as an artwork that stands possibly for its own artistic pleasures, without referencing a story from the Bible or classical story or sources, it is also the beginning of what we call the autonomous artwork. The artwork that stands on its own. And this is related to the size of the painting. If you look at the textbook illustration reproducing the painting, there's Giorgione, The Tempest, 1506, oil on canvas, 32 by 28 inches. This is a small portable easel painting. We use the term easel painting in art history to mean that it fits on a standalone easel. It's not on a wall. It's not a large scale work. This is really different. Look back to what Leonardo da Vinci was doing. 
were painting the version of the rocks in 1485. He was using oil, but on wood panel, different technique. Not in, in oil on canvas, the paint kind of soaks into the fabric, which is different than on wood panel. And this is six feet by six inches by four feet. This is bigger than a body. This is, the figures are not exactly life size, but they're approaching life size. So if we talk about the Sistine Chapel as one of the high points of the High Renaissance, the the ceiling measures 45 by 128 feet. <laughs> this is not an easel painting. And it's also painted so that it is permanently connected to the wall. It is part of the architecture now. And of course, the ceiling doesn't stand alone. It's integrated with a whole series of other frescoes that are very large. And they they stand also permanently in the space. Art was mostly site specific because art was expensive and it was made for a really important purpose in a really important place. This artwork is not. It's portable because it's made for a collector. It's made to go in someone's house and to be enjoyed as a work of art. So Giorgione is not painting for the popes. He's not painting for the dukes. He's working in Venice, which is a republic full of rich merchants. And he's painting for those who are actually art lovers. Connoisseurs is the French term that means an art lover. And so he's trying to engage and delight their imagination. He's trying to show off the f what he can do with paint. He's trying to create an ev evocative, moody scene. It gives mood more than a clear meaning. It allows the, the audience to want to dwell in the painting and wonder about it. Because that's how Giorgione captivates his audience. He's the beginning of an artist now making artwork for art lovers and not primarily for the kind of public purposes of the church or the ruler. 